Yeah, I came up uh, with the title before I was sure what I was would be talking about. But uh, so, actually, I'm going to give some introductory remarks about uh, music informatics, teaching it, some well lessons, some experiences. I'm not a pedagogue. I'm not a didactic specialist, so th this will be anecdotal. But, uh, well, I felt I had to say something about that. But the main part will be about more programming tools, more bad music, I'm afraid. <laughs> so I'm not a composer. I'm a computer scientist, a mathematician. and uh, But I will try to show some of the tools that I use to teach uh, various different kinds of students these uh, topics, which uh, sometimes can be quite hard, as we already heard yesterday. And uh, so let's jump right into it. So it's all about bridging the gaps, you know. Uh, you've probably seen that, that, uh, that cartoon there. S at some point, something miraculous happens, and then uh, the students suddenly get it or not. And uh, that's still something I'm grappling with. So it's bridging, uh, of course, bridging the gap from teacher to students. So that's didactics. Uh, from science to art, that uh, that's interdisciplinarity, um, which is also a clash of cultures. I mean, we've uh, we've uh, seen that in the in the discussion in the preceding uh, session, which is uh, can be quite difficult. It's also bridging the gap from theory to application, so practice, and from basics to expert knowledge, uh, specialization. Um, and it's also bridging the gap for most of my students from being a non-programmer to be at least a novice programmer. And that I found often to be the hardest job uh, that I have to do. And uh, so I'll be talking about uh, some of the languages and tools I've been working on to make that easier. And uh, so to just give you, as a way of introducing our little research group there, uh, we have students mostly from musicology and music, but also from computer science, from mathematics, from media science. And there's also a new uh, course of studies in the making digital humanities, uh, which uh, will teach uh, the same topics to students from all humanities. So that's going to be another challenge. And we have various courses of studies. Uh, as usual, we have the bachelor courses in various flavors. We have master courses, of course, also PhD students. And up until this year, we also had uh, traditional magister and diploma studies. So magister at, uh, in, our, in our department and Currently, we have uh, 282 students in total, so 221 right now in the bachelor courses and 135 among these in, uh, uh, who have musicology as their core subject. And these are my primary clients, so to speak. Uh, most courses either take the f uh, uh, form of seminars or t uh, tutorials, übungen. Um, uh, so we also have lectures, of course, but they're mostly in historic uh, musicology. I also do lectures every once in a while, but we're trying to cut back on that because learning something like programming really is something that you should do in a hands-on way in my opinion. Otherwise, you don't learn it at all. You just uh, learn a few theoretical concepts which you will never be able to apply again. And uh, for that, we have a self-built computer music lab, uh, which is right now, is, it's quite small. We're trying to get, um, move into something bigger, but that building still needs to be built. And, uh, well funding issues as uh, usual, but we can accommodate up to 10 students, and uh, so we have MIDI and OC equipment, PCs, um, mostly equipped with Linux, and uh, I try to run almost exclusively uh, open source software. And uh, well, just to toss out some questions that I'm constantly thinking about uh, uh, when planning new new courses uh, is uh, basically always these four questions: uh, who who will I be teaching, and um, who 
should learn music informatics and why to teach them that and uh, what are the important topics and uh, how to best convey them. And uh, so our situation at the Johannes Gutenberg uh, University is uh, that we have students from, as you've seen, from widely different backgrounds. They are in the same course. And that poses a considerable challenge. So what I'm trying to do uh, when the course uh, uh, allows it is working in groups and teams. And uh, so the question of why uh, we have students from really different backgrounds, so they all come with their own motivation, but they not just coming because they have to take the course. I also have students who are really interested in, in the kind of stuff, even though they don't strictly need the course, they maybe enroll in it anyway. And uh, so, but uh, since they are often interested in different aspects of, of the field, some want to learn how to program at least uh, in a basic way, uh, others want to, to uh, um, well, learn how to operate certain hardware where they have to do a little bit of programming to, to uh, control that hardware and stuff like that. So, uh, what I found, uh, always found a, a, a very worthwhile motivation is that it's also, it can be fun if it's done correctly. So what to teach, uh, so necessarily as I'm mostly dealing with musicologists who are not artists in themselves, uh, um, they want to have some background knowledge which uh, makes it possible for them to understand the contemporary music techniques and uh, so I teach a wide interdisciplinary range of uh, subjects uh, from classical stuff, mathematical theory of music and signal processing um, up to hot topics like how to operate uh, um, a musical algorithm by some means of control like smartphones or something like that. Um, how? to teach them. Well, in a way, this requires a kind of Faustian mindset. Uh, uh, so I constantly uh, have to change from theori theoretical aspects to practical implications. That's what I mean, not the, not the good and the evil stuff. So that's uh, something that's worth keeping in mind, which uh, if you're a mathematician, you're usually used to just throw the theorems, like Emilio has done, uh, throw theorems at uh, the students and then, uh, well, they, they must uh, deal with that. But that's not the way I can teach this subject. So, so what? These are just some of the th topics I'm not, I will not go through the list, but uh, I've highlighted a few which uh, are classical topics uh, and uh, so I've taught more or less uh, the entire list here, of course not all in the same courses but over time I've been teaching that kind of subject for over 10 years now and um, the other question of how is, well my, my answer to that is pretty traditional so we have, we are a university so um, we want to teach uh, students to become a little bit of a scientist and so we use the scientific method of course uh, to enable students to do their own research which uh, is even important and even more important in these modern times when there's so much information available on the internet and the way this is done as I said is uh, in lectures and seminars uh, uh, so in music informatics, it's, it's more seminars which are on theoretical subjects where the, the students are supposed to really um, find the, the sources that are relevant and, and then present those in, in uh, oral and written form. And the practical training that goes along with that uh, is more about um, how to actually apply this theoretical knowledge and then... Um, so this takes place in, in the tutorials and some uh, the music uh, musicians, uh, the music students may want to, to actually do some real artistic works or we just do some toy projects which uh, will help to understand the theoretical concepts. So I'm trying to integrate as much group work there as is possible because it's always nice if you can make a group of, of uh, computer science students and, and musicology students because, uh, well, uh, 
Obviously, the computer science mu uh, people will understand a lot more about programming, but then the musicologists understand a lot more about music, and so the interactions are, are very important. Uh, but still, uh, I have no silver bullet there to present, um, so I hope that uh, you lower your expectations at that point. Um, so in my experience, it's just uh, difficult and it, uh, uh, learning how to program just takes a lot of practice. And so if it takes a lot of practice, we should make this as efficient and as easy as possible, right? So and this is also in the charts of the programming language. And um, so this is where I switch to the second part of the talk where we'll talk about uh, some First, some just a laundry list of the tools that we are teaching or using there. So this is the usual kind of audio and video editing software that you work with. DAW software, of course, samplers and sequencers, software synthesizers, and notation software, very important for the musicologists, but also for many of the musician, uh, of the music students there, because uh, many need to work with uh, with uh, a classical notation and. And uh, so the tools that I use there is, uh, well, Lily Pond and Fresco, uh, with Fresco Baldi as a, as, a for, uh, uh, as a front end. Also, maybe for, for the students who, for whom it's difficult to program a score, a uh, little bit of MuseScore maybe. Uh, you see, that I try to use open source tools as much as possible. Uh, that has a practical reason and, uh, uh, well, you could say a philosophical reason. I'm a big open source fan and I've been done open source stuff uh, for since I was a student um, and releasing my stuff as uh, open source and benefiting from others, other people's stuff. But it's also a practical reason because I also want the students to be able to take the stuff with them at home install it on their computers and then work with that because uh, if for the few hours that I have them in the week that's it's not possible to really go in in deep and and uh, learn everything there so the two tools that I'm going to um, to concentrate on now is visual data flow programming so as I'm using the open source uh, variant I'm using PD for that and the programming languages uh, that I use for the audio and uh, DSP part is Faust I think it's uh, for me, uh, in teaching in teaching DSP, it's really the best thing li uh, since sliced bread. I'm, uh, that's my opinion, because it makes uh, developing these concepts and understanding them much easier. Even though in the beginning, grasping the block diagram algebra is uh, especially the the looping operation is quite difficult. But in the end, it's uh, it's still a lot better than writing pages of of C plus plus or C code, uh, uh, which uh, the, especially the musicologists uh, just, uh, they, they don't know C, uh, they don't learn that, and uh, just teaching C in the course, the course would be over before they'd be able to do anything. So uh, at least you can, on that level, you can uh, teach some basic examples. And for the symbolic stuff, I'm using my own programming language, which is also kind of related to, to, uh, to the stuff that Emilius just presented because it's a language based on terminal writing. And we take a brief look at that now. So that's the secret sauce uh, I'm using there, the secret technology. It's not so secret anymore because it's open source, of course. So uh, just to reiterate, a PD is great for many things, like Max. Uh, it's it's uh, very intuitive to use, uh, but um, it's also limited in uh, some ways, uh, as you can't do everything um, with it uh, that requires a Turing complete language, or at least capabilities which are beyond uh, the objects yet that you have there. I mean, there's lots of stuff available ex as externals, but if you're just using these these pre-built externals, then you never uh, try to understand and go beyond the stuff that's already there, and you will never be able to produce any sound that wasn't there before. So, um, so it's easy to work with as an interactive environment, but at the same time, I also want to work with these uh, um, functional programming languages to extend PD. So, and um, as you all know, uh, 
I've taken not the very simplest Faust example here, but the very simplest instrument that you can do, which will sound awful because I'm not using an envelope here. As you see, I'm just multiplying with the gate signal. But if you have these three control parameters, uh, I, I'll show you a little example later on, then you can just turn this into a, a multi uh, into a polyphonic and, and uh, multi-timbral um, instrument. And um, so these four lines, uh, five lines of code basically uh, give you the gist of what you need to do to make an instrument that can, can then be readily used either as an LV2 or as a VST plugin, but also as a plugin in PD. And um, so to compile this, you need the Faust compiler, which can produce efficient native code. Uh, for all these environments and PD and my pure programming languages are uh, included there and uh, for uh, running the uh, the Faust modules in PD I use um, an external I've written in pure uh, the other programming language um, which is uh, basically then a library of PD externals uh, which allows uh, you to load these programs so um, PD Pure is, uh, sits below that, so it's an integration of Pure into PD. Pure, as I'll explain a little bit uh, more deeply in a minute, uh, it's a kind of some, um, it's a language which uh, makes uh, symbolic processing uh, of complex um, data, symbolic data. Um, easy. It's a bit like Lisp. It's dynamically typed. It has. Uh, it's a. It's a functional programming language, but it's also quite different because it uses traditional infix operators. So, it's a. Um, what. This is a contentious issue, of course, I, but I'm not going to go into it right now. But the uh, main difference is that actually you define functions by by equations, so it's all based on term rewriting, all on symbolic computations. But it's still compiled just in time, so you can type a, a definition and then immediately calculate with it, so there's no explicit compilation step, and it's also easily embeddable in other environments, so that's why I have this plugin for PD. And um, so, and also, um, the features um, I have in this language extend by that also to PD, to, to the Faust interface, PD Faust, um, but uh, in Pure itself, it's just a, a simple matter uh, of dynamic reloading of, of the programs. So you can change them all the time while the patch keeps running. And in PD uh, Faust, it's then also possible after you compiled uh, your Faust program to just reload it and while the patch keeps running. So it's I use this mostly for debugging iterative development, but it's uh, conceivable to use this for live coding. It's probably not, not click-free enough to actually use it that way on stage, but I'm working on that. So uh, I'm not actually going to run through all these slides, but uh, uh, just to give a starting point for a little demo now, so Pure, as I said, is a functional programming language, but it's based on term rewriting, so everything is about the symbolic evaluation of expressions. You have certain kinds of basic expressions, like always, you have numbers, you have strings, character strings, you have symbols, like in Lisp, and uh, you form compound expressions uh, very much like in Lisp. In Lisp, you have these S expressions, but this is the m more modern variant of that, where you just apply a function to an argument, and basically all functions are, uh, are of uh, arity one. But you can then combine them. A function of one argument can be a function of another argument, and so on. So let's let me just uh, briefly run through a little demo there. Let me see whether that's big enough. Can you read that in the back? I can make it bigger, so no problem with that. Okay, so let's just run this little example. So um, I use on the Mac, I use Aquamax. I'm also an Emacs guy, so. Uh, um, the pure support in Emacs is very good. It's an entire uh, interactive development environment. You can run stuff with the debugger and, and, and so on. But I'm just going to use a single feature where I feed 
uh, these definitions and the expressions to be calculated into the interpreter, which isn't actually an interpreter because it's actually compiling things and then running them. So there's always native code running there. So we can define a function by pattern matching, so as symbolic equations. Uh, for instance, if you have to want to define the Fibonacci function, you can start out with Fib0 equals 0. Or you could also take 1 at the, as the result there. Fib1 is 1, and then the recursion is Fib n is the sum of, of the two previous values. This is not an efficient definition, but it serves uh, illustrative purposes here. So then I can just map this function over a range of numbers. And as you see, well, there was a slight hiccup there. That was when the compiler, the JIT compiler, kicked in and compiled it. If I do that again, it will be instantaneous. And so uh, there's also uh, similar uh, facilities like in, uh, in your talk. So you can, you can count the number of reductions, how many expression cells was, were used, but I'm not going to show that. <laughs> Another thing that you can define by pattern matching are, for instance, uh, operations on lists. So maybe we want to, to compute all diagrams in a, in a given list, so I can do it like that. Diagrams of the empty list is just the empty list and also of the singleton list. And then, again, the recursion is we have... Well, the notation is here. The, uh, the colon here basically is like the cons in Lisp. Uh, it's it's a modern syntax. So you also find that in ML and Haskell, uh, it's the same. And so the colon means cons. So we have a list here with a, starts with an X and then um, continues with a Y and then comes the rest of the list. So um, this com then concludes the definition. So I just take this pair and then uh, recurs on the rest of the list. So that's that. Okay, now I can calculate the diagrams and. Uh, I can also go crazy and define equations on constructors. Uh, so this is the symbolic evaluation stuff. I can, if I want to, uh, lists to always stay sorted, I can say if the first uh, ele two elements of the list are in the wrong order, then just swap them. That's what this equation does. And then if I enter, if I now enter a list, it will be sorted automatically. So uh, the colon, the cons, has suddenly become a clever cons or a clever cons with equations, I can, well, interactively I can clear that out again because I may not want to do that globally, but there's also the possibilities to have local rewriting rules. If you know Mathematica, uh, there's this kind of replace all operation and that's very similar, except that everything is compiled and so there's this operation reduce, which takes some argument and then uh, the, the local functions here, so the local definitions here are really confined to this one expression so I can just run this as like the others so it's the same equations as above and I was inspired by your talk yesterday to also do the piano example so you see it's sorted again even though if I enter the same list at the global level it's still unsorted it's now unsorted again so it, the rule set is really confined to this uh, to this local uh, definition so the piano example in pure, you just write down all the all the axioms and then you're done, uh, because the axioms in in the piano theory are very nice. They're just equations, and uh, all equations are taken to be universally um, quantified for for the mathematical logicians among you. So we just enter the equations, and you see, for instance, x plus successor of y is just the successor of x plus y. And that's also the definition which can be used to do calculations right away. So we have 2 plus 3 equals, well, you have to count the s's, <laughs> so it's 5. And you, do, you can do the same kind of thing with, um, with uh, subtraction, so that's defined like this. And now we can subtract uh, three, uh, 2 from uh, 3, so we get 1. And now I'll do something which shouldn't be permitted, um, 2 minus 3, which doesn't exist uh, in the natural numbers. So what happens? Well, it's 0 minus uh, the successor of 0, so it's 0 minus 1. 
you could now extend uh, the Peano numbers and stuff like that, uh, provide equations for that as well. But you see, all calculations are really done symbolically, but everything is really compiled into, into um, LLVM assembler. I can maybe show that. Uh, always forget the right option. Um, let's see. Disassemble, yes, minus D. So let's take a look at what's the current what's the current definition of plus. And there's a lot of code there, which gets all like, generated. That's LLVM assembler. Uh, it's somewhere between a real assembler and C, you could say. So that's what gets generated behind the scenes. And then uh, the, the backend, the LLVM backend, compiles it to native code. Yeah. So there we are. Um, well, I, I'm going to skip the multiplication. Uh, we, um, it's not just rewriting in pure, so we have the usual functional programming goodies like currying, so that means a function which has two arguments is actually a function of one argument which then returns a function of another argument. So you can just take the maximum function which takes two arguments, maximum zero is is the um, non-negative uh, function, so uh, um, it will return zero for negative values and, and the value itself for non-negative ones, so I can just use it like that. So I immediately, without even uh, defining a lambda expression or something like that, I get uh, I get um, a function which I can go on using. Same thing in Faust, of course, you already know that from Faust. Um, also, lambdas work like expected. You can have local function definitions, as we've uh, just seen before. You can also have local variables, which are, uh, in, pr in principle, they're not much different from local functions, but the pattern matching process is slightly different. So in Haskell, you'd say you'd call that a pattern binding. And then we also have list comprehension. So there's lots of stuff that uh, that is uh, available in the standard library, which you can use right away. And th this one will be will be uh, important for the musical example, um, uh, for the not so musical example. Um, the Fibonacci numbers done again, but with the local function definition, Fibonacci is uh, starting from A and B. And the recursion here is that you just start with the A value and then the rest of the list is just Fibonacci numbers of B and A plus B. The problem here is that um, Pure usually evaluates eagerly, so this, wouldn't, this would recurse into Samadhi. Uh, it would it just wouldn't terminate. Uh, but I've adopted one feature from from LSML, which makes it possible to just defer the evaluation of the of the setter part of the list, so to speak, so that it's uh, it's deferred until the value is actually needed. And this allows me to have streams like you have in Faust for the signals. But uh, in this case, uh, you can have streams of any kinds of objects that you can represent. Also list, uh, streams of lists or, uh, or other uh, tree-like data structures. So let's see how this works. I define a variable, a global variable, which just uh, uh, this stream defined by the number zero and one, and this is arbitrary precision integers here. The L indicates that these are long integers. They can get as big as your memory allows. So that's the definition. And I can now compute, for instance, the first 22 numbers there. Um, and uh, if you take a look at the, at the value, then after that, you see that it's uh, uh, been expanded, so and the, the uh, so the result is memoized if you if you really keep it, and uh, well the thunk here marks the place where 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 the laziness begins. These uh, these uh, objects are lazy bums indeed. They will only evaluate if they are needed. So and you can the the numbers can as get as big as I said as. Uh, um, as you want, of course, in musical applications, you're probably um, just working with some MIDI note numbers or something, then you don't need these big numbers. Okay, so 
that's been a very quick overview. Um, before I go into the demo now, um, let's just briefly talk about this dynamic uh, versus static typing uh, um, issue. I found that um, Pure is rather easy to embed in arbitrary environments, also like dynamic environments like PD, because um, if you try to do that with a statically typed language, uh, you either have a very rigid interface or the interface is being generated for you or you really uh, have a tough call. I know that uh, someone tried to integrate Haskell with PD and it was basically he ended up uh, just mapping the data structures in uh, in PD, so the message message data structure to strings in Haskell and that's of course very inconvenient. But here in P uh, with Pure it's really, it's really easy to do because Pure is dynamically typed like Lisp so you, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence very easy to translate between PD data structures and, and the pure one. So uh, actually numbers, symbols and lists, they can all be mapped one-to-one -to, -one to, uh, uh, to pure data structures and can then be processed in a symbolic way without having to parse some strings or stuff like that. So the interface is very easy. Uh, of course, dynamic typing also has its downsides, as we all know, uh, but for this kind of application, it seems entirely appropriate. Now, instead of going through these slides, I'm just going to show you the examples. So, but uh, the, the, the thing to, uh, things to keep in mind here is that in PD, objects are done the imperative way, basically. If you program an external in C, an object, it's basically an actor uh, in the data flow sense, which uh, has some internal state get some data, then does some computation, stores some intermediate results and outputs stuff on it, uh, its outlets. You can do that in Pure. You can actually program these objects in PDPure as you do in C. It's just much shorter, but it's not very elegant. So the, the kind of uh, setup that I actually will show is the stream model, which uh, is kind of uh, similar to what you do in Faust. Um, but, um, well, it provides a way to program these symbolic objects, control processing objects uh, also in a functional programming language in a purely functional way. So you see the name pure is actually kind of a pun because it's not that pure. In Faust, it's not possible to write something with side effects. Of course, at the lower level, side effects are all over, but not at the language level. Here, it's possible to do side effects in pure, but there's a purely functional core, which in, just like in Lisp, if you stick to that, then you're fine. And then the semantics are very easy and can be described uh, potentially by, by Quark or other theorem provers which I haven't done yet, but uh, okay. So let's take a look at the, at the alien stuff. Um, so I'm just going to switch to PD now, but let me, I still need the editor here, but I'm, I'm closing the interpreter. Ah, that was the wrong. Uh, okay, let me just go back there, okay. That's the program that I just showed, which is the imperative style implementation, but we're going to look at it in a little patch. So uh, to see how this works in PD, you have uh, the option to just write pure. It's a uh, defined external if you loaded the PD pure plugin. And then you can write any pure code that you want if it fits in there and if uh, if PD accepts all the characters. So usually it's easier to write the code in a, in a, a separate file, in a script file, but you can do it that way. So I can show you that this actually works and you can change it. Uh, Go into editing mode and maybe, well, maybe change it to a function which takes a parameter k and uh, uses that as the first argument. And um, now I need, of course, I need to specify the argument here. Let's make that 7. So now 
you have the new function here and you don't notice the compilation uh, well it's done it's done uh, instant almost instantaneously and the counter example so here you are communicating with pure yes it's running it's running that right there in in uh, PD like it uh, was running in in uh, in aquamax just before so I can also, uh, it's integrated quite well, as good as I could do it in PD. Uh, so you don't have to write any kind of special uh, external, like he, uh, because there's this, in PD there's this concept of a plugin loader where you can hook right into the discovery mechanism uh, PD uses to discover external. So this is, uh, if, it's, if you open it, it will execute the default action, whatever that is. I've set the action to to open pure files to um, to Aquamax, so it shows me the file here in in uh, Aquamax, and I could now try it there as well because I can run these these actor objects also from from the command line of the interpreter. But that's not the thing that we want to do. But uh, you can see that it works. Uh, well, it's not very interesting, but you can change it at any time. So, for instance, we can just um, change change the formula here. And now the thing is, I have a little abstraction here which sets up a kind of communication channel between Aquamax and PD. And so I can uh, just use a little keyboard command or go to the pure menu and go through the PD menu and say reload. So, But I'm using the keyboard shortcut. Now it, it's reloaded the script and, uh, well, you see that it's uh, the calculation is now different. But we want to go to the nice world of stream processing functions now. Uh, just have to see where I stand with my time. 14 minutes. 14? Yeah. Okay, that's great. I'm, I'm good. Um, <clears throat> So let's just get rid of that and uh, take a look at this stuff here. So I've prepared a little function which uh, right now doesn't do much, but this is also, I have to apologize in advance because I'm not a composer. I'm just going to do a very simple example, uh, which is uh, not aesthetically very pleasing probably, but just to illustrate uh, how you can work interactively with Pure and even with Faust at the same time uh, by just working in the PD patch. So that's the main, uh, main uh, focus of, of my presentation here. So... We have this object here, and it's defined in pure. I'm just going to open this file, and yeah, there it is. So very simple. I have a little helper function which uh, uh, called actor here, which uh, I'm, uh, which isn't integrated in PDP or yet, but I'm about to do that. Well, this is an interface function which turns a nice and clean uh, stream processing function into a messy actor like uh, PD wants it, right? So it takes care of, uh, of all the sta internal state that's needed, and so we don't have to worry about any of that. And I just specify an argument function, which I call step here, because in a way it's doing one step of the computation and then recurses for the rest, um, which in this case doesn't do much because I'm just taking, well, I'm looking at the stream of input values that gets received by the PD object, and I'm just outputting them again. So here is the recursion is again is delayed because this is an infinite stream. So this could run until uh, the, the end of the universe or until this computer crumbles, uh, basically because the stream, although it's not been constructed yet, is conceptually infinite. So it, it, it contains all input data. Uh, but the input data is yet to be provided. That's what the actor function takes care of. So it feeds stuff into the input stream and then I can process it and react to that. So this is what's happening here. So as you can see, this doesn't do much right now. I have to put it so that you can see that side by side. So right now it's just echoing its input. Uh, of course, this becomes more interesting if I have something interesting to output in response to the input stream. So, because I've been talking about Fibonacci earlier, and, uh, well, they 
um, can also be used to to produce some kind of um, um, musical sequences. Let's first define uh, the stream. FIPS A B is A followed by um, um, FIPS B and A plus B. And I shouldn't forget this, so that it's delayed lazily. And now... Um, I have the FIP stream, so I want to feed that into my step function so that we can step through the stream. So I just need to provide that as an argument. So we start out with the value 0, 1. Don't care about big integers here because we're just going to use the small ones here because that's all we need. Okay, so I've now modified my function so that it will respond. No, I'm not finished yet uh, because I will also have to modify the step function, which now takes an extra first argument, which is, uh, well, the output stream that I want to sequence. Here, I'm not using an internal time base or uh, click track, but I use a, a click track which gets generated by PD, um, so to speak. That's the input stream. And in response, I'm going to output the, the values from my Fibonacci stream, and then just recursively do the same with the rest. So that's, I hope that this function works, but if I'm not sure, then I can just run the same thing here right there in Aquamax. So uh, let me define this actor as A, um, stream, stream object, um, yeah, that's it. So now I can test it, for instance, let's input a bang. That's what I'm going to do later. And next bang, okay, it looks like it works okay. So these are the Fibonacci numbers. So now I can just um, run. Well, I have to reload this object now because I've changed the definition. So blop, that's done. And uh, well, I can use now the input numbers. Oh, well, you've seen that. You've seen that. Let me repeat that. Um, if I input any number here now, it will just output the next Fibonacci number because I don't care about the input value here. It's just not used anywhere. I could use that, for instance, to pass in meter messages or stuff like that or more, more, uh, more uh, interesting compositional data. So, well... We can now generate these numbers, but you see they get big uh, pretty quickly. So the way you work around that is with modulus, of course. Uh, so let's introduce an extra argument here for the modulus. Let's call it K. And then I'm just going to add this, that also as a parameter to, to the definition of the Fibonacci stream. And uh, while well, assuming that A and B are already okay, I just need to take A plus B modulus K. And then, uh, well, the step function can remain the same. Uh, yes, okay, everything should still work if I supply the extra argument. So I've reloaded this thing and then, yeah, I have only a couple of minutes left, so... Um, well, let's take 10. I know that 10 is a nice uh, value because the period, uh, the period of these uh, Fibonacci numbers modulo k depend very intricately on the value of k. So you get some interesting sequences. Well, interestingly for me as uh, uh, someone who dabbles in this kind of stuff at least. Um, so if we now use... Uh, Bang! I can use the bang over here. So we start with 0, 1, 1. So it's still the Fibonacci sequence, but now it will wrap around because I've taken a modulus of 10. So, and you can actually, um, well, the first few values of the period are actually known. You can look them up on Wikipedia. For 10, it's a period of 60, which is quite large for, for you, you probably wouldn't expect that, but that's the way these... Uh, these Fibonacci sequences modulus work. So we have some numbers. We can we can turn them into nodes. Let's just turn this into a note by adding some convenient value. Let's say 48. So I'm using MIDI here. Again, sorry about that, but uh, 
uh, it's just for for demonstration and okay we now got a new number down here and maybe I want also to equip it with some kind of meter I've pre-programmed that so I can just use this I have pre-programmed a little meter function which will uh, add pulse strengths, velocities to the notes. Uh, I use a formula by Clarence Barlow there, the indigestibility formula, which is also programmed as in pure. And then we can take a look at what comes out there. So it's still the note, no, sorry. It's still the note number here. And on the right hand side, It's the velocity, and because, uh, well, okay, but uh, we still need to turn that into something uh, which can then which can then be played back. We need some sound, uh, something that produces sound. So, let me first get rid of that and connect this to the metronome. And I want to add a little uh, Faust module here. Um, Let's take a subtractive synthesizer, for instance. I prepare a little, a little um, graph on parent subpatch, um, named synth, for instance. That's in preparation for what I'm doing next. Uh, it's the the contents will be generated. Uh, I just this is the part that's written in PD Pure, so it's an object. Um, this F synth object is an object in Pure written in pure which allows me to load faust synths in uh, in pd and i just have to give the uh, name of the of the faust program and then the name of the sub patch for the gui and then i have to specify the midi channel zero is omni and uh, the number of voices that I want. So, and now you see that uh, this all happens inside the PDD Faust interface. So the GUI gets generated automatically from the Faust program. And then we basically, we ha still have to pick up these and turn them into a real note event for, for the input of the synthesizer. Um, so I need to pass that in here. And, uh, well, I use a certain format there. It's just uh, a message which has note in front. And then I take the, um, the uh, note number and the uh, velocity and the MIDI channel, which can be, well, I just take one for that. And then it will hopefully... Well, I still need an, uh, an audio output here. And connect the audio outputs. So you see the first inlet is for control input and the first outlet for control output. And the others are depending on what the synth does. It's a, you can see it from on the message right up there. Ah, I took the organ, I promised to use something more interesting. Uh, so you see the GUI just changed. It's the subtractive synth now. Well, it has zero audio inputs and one, two audio outputs. So we should hopefully be able, if I start the sequencing, to hear some sound. But let me turn it down in the beginning. I forgot something. Sorry. <laughs> okay, this is a live situation, so um, I'm doing this live. You could see it now because of what I forgot is the make note. Um, we don't want uh, we don't want all notes to keep on sounding, so I have to uh, because I could do the note offs also in the stream, but uh, well. I can also do it here with a make note, which takes um, uh, default velocity and uh, well some 
milliseconds delay and then I need to pass on the velocity here is the second argument so now I get the note on and also note off after a while so let's run this again and uh, turn on the sound okay and now you can start going crazy there and change 23 is an interesting Okay, you get different kinds of patterns, you get the idea. And I can also change why the thing keeps running. I can also, also change uh, the definition here. For instance, if I want to have two notes, I could just use both the A. Okay, let me turn it down a bit for a moment because it gets boring pretty quickly. Uh, I could, for instance... Uh, take just the first two values and output that as a list which, which will become a list in in PD. So you see it's still running. If I turn up the sound again, it's still running. You hear only hear one note right now. But that's because, well, actually I have two values here now so I can unpack this at this point. Um, and I get a second value over here and then I can do the same stuff that I did on this side I can just duplicate put over there use the second value here you see it's already running and maybe well I'm just going to use uh, for lack of time I'm just going to use the same synth now but um, maybe take care that we use a different MIDI channel here so because the, this is actually only one sound, but it's actually internally, it's multi-temporal. Okay, so you get the idea. Uh, I could do a lot more now. For instance, I can just go in here and also change the Faust program. Um, but uh, since I think my time is up, and uh, so I'm ready to take questions. Thank you. There we are. <laughs> Where were my slides? Right. Albert, you, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation that uh, most of your students are musicology students. Right. And also that your your uh, department is, is in the stage of starting digital humanities. Right. So I'm wondering if you've thought about or if you already do some teaching of, of kind of computational analysis purposes in music and show that as another application. Of yes, I didn't talk about that here, but... Uh, you see that the methods you need for that can be pretty tricky. I mean, you can do basic stochastic stuff like uh, Markov change and stuff like that, which can also be fun because you can use the input as a compositional uh, device again. Um, so, yes. Um, I guess I'm using more like high-level tools like Music 21 or something like that. Right. Yes, I've been thinking about that, but uh, I'm trying to do uh, the methods that I can really, um, that have a, uh, a firm basis in mathematical theory of music, and so um, the, the more advanced methods that the musicologists use are sometimes difficult to formalize, and that's something I'm still struggling with. Sorry, but <laughs> that's the best answer I can give right now. So from yeah. the implementation side, uh, how do you handle the, the memory when you are in this uh, actor mode? I can show you the actual function and you can see that. Oops, I need to make that bigger. Well, let's just make it as big as possible. So, you see the entire function is down here, it's all written in pure. And uh, I have uh, some reference variables down here, which uh, basically, well, a reference is like an ML a pointer to an arbitrary pure expression. So that's a memory cell where I can, I can store stuff and I really keep just uh, a queue of a list of uh, incoming messages there, which then get uh, fed into into the, the input stream provided to um, 
to the um, to the stream processing function, and that happens over here. So it's uh, it's uh, fairly easy to do. I'd really like to recode this in C though, because I'm currently using um, Pure isn't multi-threaded yet. So I'm currently using exception handling to handle the case that uh, my stream processing function hits the end of the stream and can't look further into the future. So I'm using exception handling in Pure for that, which is a bit, uh, has slight inefficiencies. Uh, so I'd really like to do this entire function in C and just integrate it into PD Pure so that it would be available to all applications. But basically, you, you build up a, um, a finite list of input messages that you already received. And then when the, um, when the next input comes, you just run it through with your, you feed the, the input stream with it and you run the stream processing function on it and you store whatever you have in an output list and you output that to PD. So that's the way it works. It's really straightforward. But in C, I could do it with in a background thread, so that would be nicer and cleaner. Yeah. Okay. I have a question myself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with your students, when um, well, I think they work with their own computers and. Uh, uh, partially, um, yeah. if we can, uh, if we have a small course, then it's in the MIDI lab and everything is installed. Mm -hmm. Uh, but otherwise, the problem, of course, is uh, everybody brings his own computer with his own version of Windows or Mac OS. Uh, so that's, uh, I didn't talk about that, but uh, mm -hmm. that's much of what I also do, just running around and uh, helping the students fix their installations and, and get everything up and running. But uh, I did probably didn't mention that point, but I'm using open source software because of that, because it's very portable. Mm -hmm. And I try to use only tools which are available for all the three, well, for me, the three major operating systems, which are Windows, which I don't use myself, Macintosh, at least uh, recent versions of OS X and, and uh, Linux. Right. Yeah. Uh, so in these in the, in the demo, uh, Pure was running its, itself. So yes, it, yes, it was uh, running as a library inside PD, you could say. Yeah. Okay, but it it's was really running uh, inside PD, or it was just a communication that was... No, 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 it's really running right there. Okay. So okay. it's embeddable, it's just... Okay, like Pure like is, uh, is... It has an interactive front end, but that's just a few lines, main, okay. uh, a main a C main function or C++ main function. But uh, all the gist of it is in a separate library, in the runtime library, and the runtime library has a defined API. Well, it's basically a C++ or C header file, which tells you which f uh, functions you can invoke to create a new interpreter instance and then run, evaluate uh, uh, pure expressions in it, yes. So you can deliver pure as a uh, external object for a PD? Yeah, that's that's yes, just that's what PD okay. pure is, right. so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank, you. Right, well, thank you. Yep, thank you.